<laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our roundtable today on the movement for Black Lives. Where do we go from here? Generously sponsored and organized by the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation at the Harvard Kennedy School. I'm Leah wright Rigar, and I'll be your moderator for today's conversation. So today we're joined by a group of exceptional scholars for a discussion about the continuing fight for racial justice in the United States. All of our panelists will take a look at African-American history and the current moment as a means of framing out some big solutions to racial inequality in America. More on that in a second. But first, let me introduce our illustrious panelists. First, we have Kelly Carter Jackson. She's the NAFL Assistant Professor of the Humanities in the Department of Africana Studies at Wellesley College. She's the author of the award-winning book, Force and Freedom, Black Abolitionists and the Politics of Violence. Megan Francis is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Washington, Seattle, and a visiting associate professor of public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. She's the author of the award-winning book, Civil Rights and the Making of the Modern American State. I can think you guys can see a trend here, award-winning. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we have Saida Grundy. She's an assistant professor of sociology and African-American studies at Boston University. She's the author of the brilliant forthcoming book, Manhood Within the Margins, Promise, Peril, and Paradox at the Historically Black College for Men. And then finally, but certainly not least, we have Elizabeth Hinton, who's a professor of law, history, and African-American studies at Yale University. She's the author of the award-winning book, From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime, The Making of Mass Incarceration in America. Now for our next couple of minutes, just before we jump into our conversation, I wanna frame out the significance of our current moment. And I'd like to start by sharing a quote by Frederick Douglass from his famed speech, The Meaning of the Fourth of July for the Negro. And so Frederick Douglass starts his speech out 170 years ago by saying, what is your Fourth of July? I answer, a day that reveals more than all other days of the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. Your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness, swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your denunciation of tyrants, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings are mere bombast, fraud, deception and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. This is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of the United States at this very hour. And just another uh, excerpt, it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled the hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed and its crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. Now Douglas's words were written a hundred, more than a hundred, a close to 170 years ago, but they very well could have been written today. They certainly help us think through and frame our current moment of racial crisis and the fierce urgency of now. In the matter of one month, we've seen over 500 protests sweep the world proclaiming that black lives matter. We've gone from a moment to a multiracial movement for racial justice and equality, built off the history and labor of black protest and rebellion. So these protests that we're seeing, these rebellions, they're categorically a response to the failures of the American state, to the failures of American democracy, to the failures of an American project that has collapsed under the weight of its inability to answer for the needs of the people. The movement for black lives is about exposing these overlapping massive failures of the state. It's about exposing a system of capitalism that has consistently failed black and brown people, a system of healthcare that has contributed to a massive health crisis that is disproportionately killing black and brown people, an educational system that has disproportionately marginalized and excluded black and brown children. And it's about demanding accountability for the failures of public institutions, officials, politicians, public policies, and yes, even policy schools. So I think this conveys the sheer urgency of the moment and the movement. And in our conversation today, I'm hopeful that the panelists will not only be able to contextualize the crisis that we're in, but also begin to offer solutions for how we move forward in the fight for racial justice. Now, just before I open it up to the panelists, I wanna highlight that this is a roundtable. 
So the panelists should feel free to jump in with comments, but also ask their own questions of other panelists. We really want this to feel like an interactive conversation as best we can do in quarantine and in a virtual setting. And so with that, I'd like to start out with a question for the panelists. This moment that we're in right now, what does it represent for Black lives and how did we get here? So let's start off with Dr. Megan Francis. Okay, great. First, um, I'm just so excited to be here in, in esteemed company such as this. Um, I think the last time that we gathered um, was actually in person over dinner. Um, and so it's just really exciting in pandemic while we cannot gather and be together in person to actually be with you guys on this Zoom. Um, I also do want to acknowledge and appreciate um, everybody here and how much they've given to this moment and helping so many people in this country interpret this moment. Um, and I do also want to acknowledge about how exhausting it has all been for us. And so this to me, at least this conversation is already rejuvenating in so many ways. Um, so to this question though, about, oh, and one last thing though, that I really want to say, right, is, is the importance of these, of these types of gatherings and, and getting black scholars together, right? Just as a call out to different universities everywhere, right? Like not just putting one of us on panels, right? But like together. Okay, um, to your question though, uh, a moderator <laughs> um, about how did we get here, right? There's so much that I can say and obviously, right? That entire books can be written on, on that question. Um, so for just two minutes, I, I, what I do wanna say is that I think and I know that we got here through decades and through over centuries, right, of protest um, and organizing um, about Black women leading the way. Many people on this panel already know, though, in terms of the work that I do, it's really focused on the early 20th century and examining the NAACP's work around this question around lynching and mob violence and really believing that the fight to protect Black lives is the first civil right. But like that, 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 like idea comes from, of course, Ida B. Wells, right? In terms of doing these investigation, producing this knowledge um, and really calling, calling out our nation for the killing of black people um, by hands of the state as well as by white vigilantes. Um, but I mean, one of the things, especially in this current moment, if we move forward through the 20th century, through the 21st century, in terms of at least in the last decade, which has led to this, is that I think it's really important. And of course, this is following the work of many historians who have said this in this moment, that this does not just come out of a vacuum, right? That in terms of whether it's the language, the strategies, um, the agenda making setting in this moment comes from a host of different organizing that has happened, whether that's labor and the fight for 15, whether that is of course the abolition, organizing housing justice, indigenous activism, voting rights, climate education, of course, um, and healthcare for all, that all of these different movements have, have done the work in providing the type of political education to people who have gone involved as well as to larger society. It has provided networks and organizations for people in this moment to actually plug into. The last thing that I'll say for 30 seconds um, is that I think that part of the reason how we got here in this moment is, is a recentering of violence um, as, as kind of a centerpiece of what it means to be free and equal and a citizen in this country. Um, and that's something I think oftentimes we talk about, like what does a civil rights promise mean in the terms of voting and education, and those are radical issues, um, but we don't talk about violence because it has a way of violating our democratic sensibilities. Um, and so what has happened in this moment is a centering of violence. So I'll end there. Thanks so much. Hey guys. <laughs> Okay, so next up we have uh, Dr. Elizabeth Hinton. Hi, thank you so much, Leah, for organizing this panel. And just to echo everything that Megan said, it is so thrilling to be here with with you for, you know, you, you, you already know you're some of my favorite people in the world, but also the scholars who I most admire most. So this, this um, for me, this is kind of just like a dream come true to be here with all of you. So thank you and thanks Leah for putting this together. So in terms of how um, we got here, you know, I think Leah opening up with, uh, especially this weekend with Douglas's remor remarks about the 4th of July is really key. What Douglas is saying is, um, you know, the thin veil to cover up the crimes is the lack of really reckoning with our history, the history of exploitation, the history of genocide that is at the very foundations of this country. And I think that 
really this movement for Black Lives, and we see the, these kind these kind of um, new discussions and new reckonings with um, racial injustice and oppression that come up on a collective basis um, every 25, 50 years. But this is really about a lack of um, fundamentally reckoning with the ways in which our history has created these deep, deep injustices and that we have not come to terms with, that we didn't come to terms with after slavery, um, during the first reconstruction, that the civil rights movement um, was limited in terms of really fundamentally addressing um, the, the deep, not just kind of civic and civil, but socioeconomic and political um, inequalities in, in the US. And, and so I think until um, we, be, we actually become a more equal society or an egalitarian society, we're going to keep on having these reckonings and, and the lives of black people, the lives of people of color are going to continue to be devalued. So for me, um, I think that's what this moment is really about, uh, a new reckoning with our history. And I think we got here again, because we failed to really reckon and meet the challenges um, and make the commitments necessary to actually deal with racial inequality and domination in the US. So thank you for that, Elizabeth. And next up, uh, Kelly, love to hear it, Dr. Carter Jackson. Hi, I'm gonna echo what a lot of people have already said. First, it's awesome to be here to see all of your faces. This is like uh, so invigorating for me because I think Zoom has just allowed us to connect in ways that you know, we're just not possible um, on any other format. So this is just great for me. Um, and I love that you started with the Douglas quote because I tell people all the time that Frederick Douglass is my boyfriend and <laughs> my historical boyfriend. I love him. And I can't quote him enough because he is literally a prophet of his time. Everything that he says, you drop it into any moment in history and it just fits perfectly. And it's so relevant and it's so timely. Um, I think a lot of the work of the abolitionists, the people that I studied the most, their, their message, their strategy, their ideas are so prescient. I think about um, Black abolitionists in particular because they're not just pushing emancipation, they're also pushing for equality and they understand that emancipation is not liberation, right? That's the first step, but it's not the final step that in order to really get everyone to experience their full freedom, you can't just simply say, okay, you're no longer a slave, right? You have to enfranchise people. You have to give them all of the tools and equipment that you need to be their best selves. Um, and I also think Joshua Easton, another black abolitionist talks about this as well, where he says, you can dismantle the institution of slavery, but until you deal with anti-blackness or the degradation of, of black people, we'll still be dealing with the spirit of slavery even when the institution has been abolished. So it's crazy to me that like 165 years post-emancipation, we're still dealing with these same issues. We're still giving Frederick Douglass a speech as though he wrote it yesterday. Um, that's what's so depressing in a way is that like, gosh, we have not learned these lessons. Um, but it's also encouraging to know that we have a roadmap. We can do this. These problems aren't unsolvable. These problems aren't impossible. That if the abolitionists, a small, maybe several hundred group of fanatical, radical people could overturn an institution that no one thought would be possible to abolish. How much more can we do with the resources that we have, with the enfranchisement that we have? So yes, it's, it's sad, but at the same time, I'm also really encouraged and empowered about what change can look like going from here forward. So thank you for that, Dr. Carter Jackson. And then last but not least, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Saida Grundy. Let's hear from you. Hello everyone. Um, uh, to uh, continue in this love fest, you know, when, when we say cite black women in sociology, I have the illustrious privilege of citing my friends. So these are uh, some of four of the women who I really cite the most and who have uh, enhanced me as a sociologist. Uh, I'm the only non- no, Megan and I 
are the non-historians here. Um, but you all have uh, greatly, greatly contributed to um, our work and understanding with some, some masterful work. So, you know, with this, uh, with this question that you're asking and, and what I, you know, I, I, I just heard, you know, Kelly talking about uh, this, I'm always very interested, maybe because in sociology, it's like we're like pattern seekers, right? There's, it's cyclical, right? So uh, I remember, you know, being very young, one of the first sort of fields that I studied was uh, reconstruction and it introduced this idea to me of the nadir. The nadir meaning the lowest point in uh, basically black liberation came actually after reconstruction, which was one of the highest points. That's the acme, right? And so there's this cyclical, you know, what Carol Anderson would say, ba white backlash. And that the, the moment that we are in now is actually not novel. It's actually part of a large pattern of white backlash to perceived black progress, right? It doesn't even have to actually be black progress. It's just the perception of black progress. And so if we understand that, then we can understand piecing together some other ways that the racialized state, racial capitalism has already shown us its playbook, right? We actually are not reinventing the wheel in terms of where we are now. So uh, for example, the rise of the neo-confederacy, right? The rise of the neo-confederacy really symbolizes, well, not symbolize, it really is the black nadir um, when you have quite literally the sons and daughters of the confederacy in the early 20th century come to power and their thing is about restoring white supremacy in the way that their immediate ancestors literally meant it, right? This was their idea that this was God's ordained racial hierarchy and that basically any black liberation was disrupting what they uh, felt was an ordained sense of exploitation. Um, so, you know, Woodrow Wilson, Thomas Dixon, um, these are all literally sons of the Confederacy. So what we have now is, you know, our black degradation is actually sort of a, a it's a multi-generational white violence, right? That, um, you know, it, it is, it's not a, a static process that we go through. White violence adapts to its moment and what it perceives as black progress in the moment. So, you know, if you read, you know, Elizabeth Hinton's book, which you all should, you understand that our ideas about mass incarceration come as a backlash to black liberation that comes out of the 60s, right? The state is hysteric about this idea of black people in not only in cities and states in America, but black liberation is having its spring across the world. The continent of Africa is having its liberation. There's this hysteria that this will topple the state. And what we see as a response to that is a type of violence that is done legislatively and through policy. I think in this moment, it's very easy for us to, and rightfully so, give our attention to the violence that is very palpable and that we can see, right? It's very, you can't not see those eight minutes of George Floyd, right? You can't not see Emmett Till's body. But if we actually zoom out a bit, we understand that that is one form of the violence, but it's really the tip of the iceberg because what's happened to us historically is that this violence was done in rolling black, back black progress through legislation, through policy. Um, and there's also all sorts of violences that happen to black people that, um, you know, Frederick Douglass, my favorite feminist, you know, that's Kelly's boyfriend. That's my favorite feminist uh, or top five feminists, right? Dylan, Dylan, Dylan. Um, but my, my uh, real reverence for, for Douglas is that he understood, really, he was the proto all Black Lives Matter, right? He was the prototype and the proto-feminist of this idea that violence to Black people was not just violence to straight Black men. And in fact, and in, and in taking our ball off of queer Black people, Black women, marginalized Black people, we've actually lost sight of the types of violences that are done to us in housing, economic violence, um, food violence, right? All these other forms of injustice that were really deliberately about hurting um, us from basically the bottom down, right? Um, and I think that's part of why we're in this moment is that we actually just 
haven't seen this moment in terms of it's a result of a type of white, white violence that was done the whole time, right? It's just a very, it's an unignorable moment because it's so graphic, but all of this polite white violence was done through legislation the whole time. So thank you for that. Thank you to all the panelists for that great overview. And I'm struck by a couple of things. Um, I mean, you guys gave us lots of different themes, lots of ideas, and I wanna try and bring that all together. And there are two things that really jump out to me that everybody mentioned that I wanna follow up on. The first is the idea of violence, but particularly, and this is, I think, um, uh, just to follow up on Saida's point, this is a particularly salient point about what do we do, how, how do we look at the issue beyond simply graphic violence, whether it's George Floyd, whether it's Emma Till, whether it's you know, Sandra Bland, whether it's Breonna Taylor, you know, these kinds of things. Um, and I think one of the things that we're pointing out is that the context of quarantine actually renders graphic forms, but also normally invisible forms of violence, right? Or polite violence, right? Or non-physical forms of violence actually renders that much clearer. So right now, part of you know, why we are seeing these massive protests erupt in the last you know, month is that we all have our blinders off, right? Black people haven't had their blinders off forever. They've never had blinders on. But now the rest of the world has those blinders off and they're finding ways to either project their own kind of uh, uh, issues onto this, but also to see the ways in which these things are connected. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can talk a little bit more about this idea of violence. But the other thing that struck me that, all, that everybody mentioned, but Kelly said explicitly, is that we have a roadmap, <laughs> right? As we think about these issues, about racial injustice, about anti-Blackness, about how we move forward, you know, all of you said, there is a roadmap. We know what to do. We just haven't done it. So I'm hoping that we can talk about this. And I, I wanna start off by, uh, with Elizabeth, because I know you've written extensively about the 1960s mass incarceration, about policing um, and about racial injustice. But one of the things that, that strikes me and everybody should go take a look at Elizabeth's most recent article in the New York Times where she talks about this. But it strikes me that you say, you know, we knew what to do in the 1960s and we didn't do it. So Elizabeth. So yeah, I mean, I anyone who's read my book knows that I am um, extremely critical of the Johnson administration and the war on poverty because, you know, as Saida says, I love this idea of polite violence. I mean, that like <laughs> war on poverty is a, is a perfect example of polite violence because of all of the racist assumptions about um, about black poverty and black behavior that went into the crafting of of um, of those programs and of that intervention. And so even though it has this flashy name and we imagine that the war on poverty was this like real investment and real redistribution, um, the war on poverty was fought really cheaply. And it was mostly, you know, instead of a job creation program, it was essentially a job training program. It didn't, you know, revamp and rehaul urban public schools. It um, it, it provided remedial education. And, and so all of these like, fundamental shortcomings. The structural intervention came in, of course, um, the form of the war on crime and a job creation program for policing and new investments in prisons and new investments in the investments in the militarization of police. But there are, um, you know, despite all of those <laughs> fundamental shortcomings and, and really the kind of legacies that brought us to this point today, there are some really important policy precedents um, during that period that I think we need to to revisit today, because I think part of what's necessary is um, we need to begin to invest resources in communities and we need to empower communities to, um, and this was a guiding principle of the war on poverty, solve their own problems on their own terms. We cannot have, and this again, I think is um, what leads to so many, so much of the problems we're seeing with policing. Outside forces, outside social workers cannot come into um, low income communities of color, especially, and tell people what's good for them or tell people what they need. Um, those communities need to be empowered to be able to make those decisions for themselves. And in many ways, they're already doing that. There are so many vibrant organizations on the ground that are doing that, but those organizations are underfunded and they need to be funded at scale. The same you know, amount that we devote to police in those communities, we need to start devoting into social welfare services that are community run. And the policy principle for this is this thing called maximum feasible participation. 
which steered the kind of early war on poverty programs where for the first time, really only from 1964 to 1965, um, and then increasingly um, police and, um, and kind of municipal administrators uh, had a greater role in the direction of these programs, but the federal government was funding grassroots organizations directly, giving tens of millions of dollars to organizations like Mobilization for Youth in New York City's Lower East Side, which was um, providing jobs and, and providing um, resources so that residents could do things like um, strike against slum landlords. Remember the um, Stone in Chicago got right, great. Exactly. The Woodlawn Organization. So I think, you know, we haven't had this kind of of major federal investment since. Um, now many kind of nonprofits are funded through block grants, if at all. And I think that we really need to start like funneling money into um, or organizations at the local level. And there's a precedent for it. And I think that's really important. It's not about reinventing the wheel. Again, roadmap. Um, you know, initially that roadmap might have been misguided, but it does have the seeds of something that might be useful for us today. Yeah, so thank you for that, um, Elizabeth. And this actually makes me think about a, a couple of things with um, with ideas about roadmaps, about guidance, about guidelines, but also this idea of different kinds of violence. Um, and I actually wanna turn it over to um, Megan for a second, because I think uh, one, Megan has, uh, has a new article out in the Washington Post that everyone should take a look at, but also Megan has this really quite brilliant TED talk that she gave a couple of years ago that has gone super viral, everyone should take a look at that, on state violence, where she talks about and works through um, uh, this experience of the NAACP, but also the legal origins of violence and how violence and state violence is actually inherently connected to ideas of Black Lives Matter and Black life. Um, I'm also interested, Megan, because I know your most recent work looks at the role of Black women in creation in relationship to this kind of idea of state violence, but also the relations, this larger relationship to philanthropy, which is the underpinning for a lot of these protest movements, right? So they're all interconnected in really important ways. And I would love if you could, if you could jump in on that. Yeah, I'd love to. So um, just really want to amplify everything um, that Professor Hinton said about this idea in terms of funding grassroots organizations and funding people from the communities where they actually are. And one of the things that's been really interesting <laughs> in this moment is, right, is like after the murder of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, a number of people came to me, they're like, Megan, what can we do? This is so crazy. Well, one, right, like, where have you been? Because it's been crazy forever, right? And like, black parents have been telling their kids, so like, what rock have you been under? Okay. That, that said, in terms of the solution aspect, though, in terms of what we can actually do, has been really interesting for me also to like hear in terms of the, the lack of imagination of so many about what can actually be done. And then obviously what has come out over the last month, more than any other time, at least in my lifetime, has been like in terms of calls for um, divesting and investing um, like those have actually moved from somewhat the fringes, like to the center, right? And that people have been working in that for a long time, that communities who have long lost trust in policing have had to, because of survival, figured out different ways to be, have had to figure out different forms of, a trans, uh, of transparency, of accountability, of harm reduction to survive, right? And so communities, have been doing this work for a long time. The problem, and this is something that I've been thinking a lot about right now, especially in this moment in thinking about philanthropy and big philanthropy in general, is the lack of investing and the lack of trusting of black women led organizations. Um, and this has been something for like, that is, I am not the first person to say this. There are many black and Latinx women in philanthropy who are, who are presidents, there are very few, who are program officers and are leaders of nonprofit organizations who will say, look, that you can have an organization that like actually focuses on black communities that is that is white male led, get funding with almost zero questions. And yet black women led organizations don't get a lot of funding and or it's very restricted funding, right? And so one of the interesting things for me is that big philanthropy has funded criminal justice at, at, at incredible levels, especially over the last five years. Um, but it has been like a criminal justice and I'm using criminal justice, even though that's a word that I don't tend to use, um, but they have funded criminal justice reform efforts. Um, and then I think for a number of people who are in philanthropy right now, it's like, how do we miss this mark? As people who, in terms of part of our legitimacy, 
is bound by we support social justice movements and innovation, right? Where, how did we miss the mark so badly in this moment? What, why didn't we fund abolition and black women led organizations who are focused on defunding and abolition in different ways, different forms of being in this moment? Um, and so like, not only in terms of, is there like opportunities, does government need to like reinvest in communities and people who are already leaders in their communities, but it's also the case that philanthropy who like as a result of, of course, we know so many, so much funding cuts that have happened, philanthropy has stepped up in like in like and filled up not all that space, but some of that space. And it has, has not yet, and right now I think has a problem with funding and trusting black and Latinx women-led organizations to do the work that they do. So I just want to say that, I mean, obviously I could talk about all the other stuff, but I really want to underscore that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> if I and can, Tate, you want to come here? Yeah, go ahead. So if I, if I can I add to that, you know, Professor Francis is, is on the mark. Um, and, you know, to the, to the point we've been making in not funding black women, if you think of black women um, in terms of black community structures and being really voices from the well in terms of black household economics, et cetera, and not funding black women, we, again, we have circumvented the ways in which things like economic violence have happened to our communities because we actually have not listened to the people who are basically the CFOs of our communities, right? Um, that is, you know, that is, is, is front and center. And when, you know, we, we, you know, we talk about reparations, which we should be talking about, but reparations as, you know, Randall Robinson told us 20 years ago, is not about dispersing checks to individual black people, right? I don't need a check as we speak. I don't think, you know, any of us do. We're not the ones we're trying to bring up. What it's about was this economic justice to black communities about bringing up the black poor, right? It was about, if the black poor, because of our slaveocracy has been placed in a permanent inferior class in this country, right? Then the only type of justice um, that can be done in terms of reparations has to lift the shelf of them. This is what Du Bois was talking about with Talented 10th. I don't know how we revamp Talented 10th into this idea of the talented 1%. Du Bois was talking about a, a, a fealty to the black poor. He was not talking about the exceptionalism of black elites. So with that in mind, that was me echoing <laughs> what was just said about recentering black women in these communities in terms of understanding the scope of the economic violence. Can I two finger this just very quickly? I promise it's gonna be 30 seconds. Just also in terms of what, what Saida has said that this also means in terms of, we can say a lot more about the woke economy and, and the grifters off of the woke economy, right? But there has also been in terms of like a focus on funding, especially like black men, um, and that's perfectly fine, right? But there's also in terms of that black women have again been doing doing this work. And when when we say that we don't have, we don't know what to do, it means that you're just like not seeing what is actually before you. Right, so not just cite black women, fund black women, right? Okay, bye. And recognize black women, right? Because I, I think about um, Kimberly Kenshaw gives this like really wonderful, wonderful talk where she says, rattles off the list of names of black men who have been killed by the police or by the state and everyone in the room knows their names. And then when she starts talking about black women, nobody knows their names. I mean, we can see the discrepancy right now. Breonna Taylor is, you know, we are still fighting for justice over that. And we haven't actually like had an acknowledgement. And we have to actually ask ourselves, why is it that Breonna Taylor's case, which amongst all these cases actually feels the most egregious mm -hmm. out of all of these state violence cases, right? She's a no knock warrant kicked in and murdered in her bed while she's sleeping. Why is it that we have to struggle and fight the hardest to actually recognize the violence that is done in this case. Um, I do wanna turn it over to Kelly and get Kelly into this conversation, particularly since Kelly is an expert on violence, but also an expert on violence and gender from the, from the perspective of agency of uh, marginalized communities. So Kelly, I'm wondering if you could just jump in on this conversation. Yeah, yeah. You have a lot to say. <laughs> Did somebody say violence? <laughs> like, <laughs> like I, I, there's so much to say about violence in this moment. And I'm always trying to shift the narrative because while I think that 
talking about violence is so important. I think the way that it's been talked about in the media has been this very like narrow, what about the looters? What about the writers? What about, um, you know, the destruction of property and how we put property on the same, you know, uh, space level of, of dead black bodies and police brutality and the destruction and the uh, violence that's happening in the black communities. And we're concerned about buildings, we're concerned about things that are insured, things that can be replaced, things that are um, material. So, um, but what I don't think we talk enough about is the legitimacy of violence, the hard truth of violence that, listen, violence works. We don't wanna talk about that, but it works. So when we think about every single moment throughout history on these historical timelines, Violence is the engine. Violence is the turning point. It's the accelerator. It is the it's the the thing that we hinge change on from the American Revolution, actually from the conquest of uh, indigenous people to the American Revolution through the Civil War, World War One, World War Two, Vietnam, post 11 You name it. Violence is that shifter. So I think we haven't been honest about what really allows us to have different pinpoints on the timeline as a significant change. Um, and we haven't been honest about the fact that like black people have never just taken beatings lying down, right? What we see in the news in terms of black people, you know, lying, lying helpless or being abused by the police, that we have always fought back and that we have always owned armed and black women, especially um, because black women are, have been the most vulnerable to not just state violence, but interpersonal violence. Um, and we have to be able to talk about how should oppressed people respond to their oppression? What should be their form of, of you know, reciprocity in terms of how to handle this violence. And from the abolitionists and uh, going forward, you know, they picked up arms, they picked up guns. I talk about protective violence. This is not going after people, but they defended their communities. They defended their families. They defended their kin. They defended people who they didn't even know, but they knew were fugitives and they were trying to help them, help protect them from, from slave catchers in the state. Uh, I just think we need to have a much more honest, nuanced conversation about how violence works in both directions um, and what that looks like. Because when, you know, I think about the couple in, was it St. Louis, the white couple, the lawyers that came out with like the AR-15 and like the gun, you know, the she, the wife's got this pistol. And I'm like, what are you doing like for, for protesters? But, you know, when you flip that script and when we see black people, like these crazy white men, what you know, marching down the street. If we saw them in guns, if we saw them armed to the teeth at a state capitol, you know, which we've seen before, mind you, with the Black Panthers. This is not new either. Like the response was effective in terms of how we think about change. So I just I want to be able to have those conversations because I think we've shied away from violence, or we only talk about violence in terms of how it impacts. Um, black bodies and black communities, but I, I always like to look at resistance and how people are pushing back and saying, I will speak to you in your own language. You want to use violence? I will, I will speak to you violently. Yeah, so Kelly, if I can ask a follow-up question and everyone should feel free to jump in on this too. I'm also really struck by like these, these larger conversations that we're having and there's this emphasis, particularly amongst the, you know, the, the pundit class of, of television, you know, people who weigh in, who say peaceful, peaceful, peaceful. Um, and yet what you're saying is I want something that's a little more complicated. And then it struck me that actually one of the things that we've seen since 2016 is that black women gun ownership has gone through the roof. Right. Mm -hmm. It's something like it's jumped from like 10 percent of black women were, you know, held gun permits to immediately following the 2016 election. It jumps like to 30 to 35 percent. Mm -hmm. We're now seeing the development, not just of black Second Amendment clubs, but we're seeing like black women in defense of their themselves clubs. Right. There's there's this new culture emerging. And I'm wondering that if if you can tie it maybe a little bit to the kind of protests that we're seeing as a way of exploding this idea that peaceful protest is, you know, 
to be moralized, is to be respected, is to be, you know, we all talk about Martin Luther King Jr., but are we talking about Robert F. Williams? Are we talking about the fact that, you know, like, Fannie Lou Hamer might have packed a pistol occasionally once in a while? All like these people were packing pistols, like, all of them. Like, I mean, and the funny thing is, is that, you know, Daisy Bates, the civil rights, rights activist of the Little Rock Nine, talks about how she heard someone trying to break into her home. She got her pistol. She opened her garage door. She shot, she shoots uh, six uh, rounds off. Like, hey, whoever is out there, I'm letting you know that I'm armed. They hop in a car, they take off, you know. But um, she let people know that she was armed. She carried a pistol with her. Rosa Parks talks, you know, almost romantically about her grandfather and him staying up all night with the with the with the rifle um and then in my own family it's so funny how shocked I was that like I was like oh no I don't like guns they're violent and then when my grandmother when my grandmother died we were cleaning out her apartment I opened up her her nightstand and there's a pistol and I'm like grandma <laughs> like, but black women carry guns. Like black women have always protected themselves. Ida B. Wells talks about this. Um, you know, Harriet Tubman is always packing. So I think that again, we haven't really had an honest historical um, look at the relationship between black women and arms and how they have always sought to protect themselves, particularly their children, um, their loved ones. From, from the clan and not even just the clan, but from violence in general. Mm -hmm. Can I jump in on this real quickly too? So I wanna like the, the question about the peaceful protest is really important. And Kelly's, um, Kelly's point about the fact that revolutions are violent. Revolutions do not come, um, have not come historically at least through nonviolent protests. And one of the things I think is really important about certainly the period in the 1960s, but also today is that, you know, both nonviolent and violent protests were entwined forces that shaped the decade. Many of the successes of the civil rights movement in part played off of um, the threat of collective violence and urban uprisings that were going on in the same period. And I think, you know, you have to wonder, um, we have been, I mean, certainly since Ferguson on a national stage, been protesting for Black lives in a nonviolent, um, for the most part, way. And we haven't seen, I mean, the, the kinds of results that have happened just in these past few weeks. People have been calling for the monuments, the Confederate monuments to come down, and now they're actually coming down. And I think a lot of that has to do with not only the sustained protest that, that's going on, but this kind of like threat of if, if we continue to be met by violence, polite violence and physical violence on, you know, on the part of state forces, um, we will uh, fight back violently. And so I think that threat is, is helping to explain some of the changes and it's also getting people's attention. It's getting, you know, the word systemic racism being kind of part of like Joe Biden talking about systemic racism. Um, you know, th this is a new, this is new white people talking about systemic racism and also you know, the majority of white people saying for the first time that black lives uh, is, is a legitimate, is legitimate, that these protests are, are legitimate. And I think part of what's helping that is this, the, the, the violent um, current that's running throughout this and the threat of violence. Can I just say this really quickly? This is the first 4th of July I have experienced where I see more Black Lives Matter signs than flags. <laughs> and, and I live in a predominantly white community and I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> like, it's, it's just shocking to me how people are so quick to change their tune when they feel that they're, that something else might be threatened more. Yeah. So I, I, if I, I, Said, if I could just jump in, I want to frame one thing and then I'm going to call, I'm going to bring you into the conversation actually very specifically. Um, I did want to highlight some of the things that the panelists are saying, but one of the big things is that there has been a huge cultural shift in just one month where the majority of the nation now stands in support of Black Lives Matter, right? Like this is polling data backs this up. Like 70% of Americans, including white Americans, can set, now say Black Lives Matter. Two years ago, they couldn't say it. Um, and I think that's huge. That is really, really big. But it also brings up a question, and I know Saida, I wanna get you in on this, about what does that actually mean? Is it symbolic? Is it, I think Saida, you mentioned it as romanticism <laughs> around consciousness raising. Or is it something, you know, is there something concrete that can be pulled out of that? 
So I want to start at all angles. This is like a huge buffet of, of things to uh, gobble up. Um, one thing that, you know, both Kelly and Liz are talking about, which is so important for us to crystallize here, is that part of the actual polite violence that is done to Black people is a denial of the valid validity of their violence, right? So throughout we see, you know, uh, you know I'm, I'm very, I've, I've, I've very much taken back up to studying South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commissions because I find them very fascinating. Part of the reason I find them fascinating is because there was an immediate, immediate cultural movement by whites upon Mandela's release and upon the rise of black political power in South Africa to reframe what their movement was even about. And all you heard, remember when Mandela died, all you heard all around, you know, white news outlets, he just, he forgave them. He forgave them. He didn't know he was nonviolent. First of all, Mandela was not nonviolent. King called for direct action. Nonviolent happened to be his philosophy. He didn't find that violence was invalid though. Mandela called for direct action action. He was about that life, right? There was nothing that was indirect about the action of the ANC, right? Winnie was about direct action. And what we did upon their death, death is we made him this old, innocuous, you know, uh, grandfatherly type man who was not at all, you know, he just forgave everybody. We made him sound like Uncle Remus. That's not at all what Mandela was about, right? And that is actually part of the violence that we do to black struggles and to black life. We say that violence is for the state. We are celebrating an actual holiday that is nothing but a remembrance of violence, right? Violence is for the state. Violence is valid in the hands of any white person who would like to enact it because they are, based, they are just extensions of the state. The state is for them. Police are the concierge service of white violence. But black people's violence is invalid. And in fact, we will morally determine that your violence is invalid by trying to shame black people out of that, right? That is not at all what our history tells us. When Kelly makes the point, speak to you in your own language, that is exactly what black movements have done. We will speak to you in your own language, right? We always do this denial of white violence in terms of we deny that it exists, we deny it in all its forms, but we do this repudiation of black violence, right? That somehow the good black people are the ones who won't take direct action. And we end up really rebranding and really whitewashing much of this black leadership, right? We make them passive, which is one of the greatest injuries you can do to our struggle and why so many of our young people don't know that we have a blueprint. Right. So I, I have a I have a couple questions, but before I do that, does anyone want to jump in on on any points that Saida made? She made a lot. <laughs> I mean, I just I just yeah, want to just did. appreciate. I mean, initially when she was talking, I spinned in my chair and I said out loud a word. Um, but I do in terms of one of the so much of what she said really really calls us in terms of this moment and and. and and something that I've been talking to a lot of people about, which is the need to unlearn, um, right? So it's not just in terms of, I know that there's been an emphasis in this moment to like educate yourself and to learn more things. Uh, but like, it's clear that many people have learned. It's not that they haven't learned, they just learned the wrong thing, right? And so people need to unlearn some of what they've, what they've learned. And I think also what Saida's comments call us to is in terms of, I think sometimes we like our civil rights and our struggles packaged to us really neatly. Um, and in a way that's easily to digest. Um, but that's not that's not what is needed in this moment. That is not what is called for in this moment, right? Mm -hmm. What is called for in this moment is for you to unlearn and relearn and struggle through some texts um, that are gonna deliver truth to you, right? Um, so that's just in terms of something that I wanted to, to underscore real quick. I know you asked about consciousness raising, which we didn't get to, but uh, to, to hear Megan's point, uh, a segue to that. Um, one of the things that you know I've 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 been discussing this week. Uh, shout out to Lauren Williams at the Atlantic. We have been discussing basically again this romance that we often have with consciousness raising in terms of um, consciousness. 
raising is it, it actually coming out of the 70s, coming out of a lot of mainstream feminist movements, there was a belief that if you just created people's awareness about these issues, that that basically was the movement, right? That would produce these end goals that would change, you know, all these other structures. And uh, I think if you ask a, a, a number of those mainstream feminist foremothers from, you know, the 60s and 70s, they would say, ah, I'm not sure if that worked, right? I like to think of consciousness raising, the idea that, you know, okay, we have lists of books. I don't like all the books on those lists, but it's good that we have some books, right? We have, you know, we have anti-racism books. We have, uh, we do not need to not read black people in talking about anti-racism. Reason we have had plenty of those. Um, but this idea that you can sort of, you know, just read or you know, converse your way out of it, I know the irony in terms of us doing this now, but that stuff I like to think about as being like paint on the walls in a house, right? It's important, it helps enhance things, and it should be an end goal. But we have put that before justice because we've offered it in lieu of justice. And justice is not abstract. We keep talking about black justice as though, oh, maybe it will happen in our children's lives. And oh, maybe, you know, in the next hundred years, we have to deal with this. We would never tell Holocaust survivors that maybe, maybe in their grandchildren's grandchildren's lives, they will be able to bring some of these Nazis to trial. Denazification started almost immediately, right? We would never tell Holocaust survivors they cannot get justice. We have all sorts of again, blueprints all over the world for people who are victims of state violence immediately calling for these systems be held accountable. When Mandela organized, you know, was, or was architecting truth and reconciliation, the point was these systems are not abstract. Systems are nothing but personnel who are people incentivized to do harm or incentivized to not care about the harm that they're doing, right? They are personally incentivized to participate in these systems. In order to get to what the system is, in order to visualize the system, to make it visible, you have to bring people out and everyone has to say what they've done. What we have now is we have given a consciousness raising architecture to white people to say, oh, those white people over there with the red hats on, they're racist. But see, I'm holding up this book by this white woman who does um, corporate training on racism. <laughs> and somehow I'm one of the good ones. That's not how systems work and it's not how systems get held accountable. You bring everyone out and everyone has to say what they've done. We can start this at the, at the most immediate scale of policing. We don't need police reform. You know, one of the things I love about Kelly's book is it points out the absurdity of what if we had called for slavery reform? Yeah. Which actually, which, which brings me to, I wanna make sure that we have a little bit of time for the questions, um, which right now I'll give you guys a, a, a little bit of a hint. The comment section is hot, <laughs> but I do wanna um, wrap it up and do one quick round robin before we open it up to Q and A. And I think Saida's point is a good segue into asking everybody else, the other panelists, you know, what are solutions? What do solutions actually look like? And so I know we've had a lot of conversations in the past month about, you know, oh, we'll see policing reform, right? Emphasis on reform. But we've also seen a lot of conversations, particularly from people in grassroots, people who have been on the ground doing this for decades, for generations, who are saying, no, solutions actually look different. And this is what they look like. So can we start off, why don't we start off with, with Elizabeth, just like quickly, you know, what are some solutions for the moment that we're in right now? Yeah, so I, I mean, I let me just say like body cams and hardware and some of the solutions that have been thrown out there are not solution and we, we cannot train our way out of this. I mean, I think like one of the big lessons or the lesson from my work is that, you know, throwing hundreds of millions, billions of dollars at policing and at um, new surveillance technologies and at incarceration um, at the expense of and while divesting from social welfare programs is is the biggest, uh, arguably the biggest policy failure in the history of the United States or one of them, certainly in the late 20th century. And so this hasn't worked um, and we're not gonna train and hardware our way out of this. So again, I think um, the solution is, you know, rethinking of our investments. I, I like the divest invest frame because it's not just about um, defunding the police and scaling back uh, the carceral state 
in the lives of, of the most vulnerable people in this country. It's about making new sets of investments and empowering people to choose how, how those investments um, should be should be spent. I don't want any child in this country to drink from lead contaminated water anymore. There's no reason why that should be. And we need to not have that kind of violence happening um, in our children's mouths every day. All right, so Megan. Um, hi, okay. <laughs> um, just, uh, just, a, just a quick two finger on what Elizabeth mentioned um, in terms of this invest and divest, um, divest and invest framework. Um, there's a, for those who are still trying to understand it, there's a really great article by Dustin Jenkins, um, who's a professor at the University of Chicago out um, this week from The Nation that is really helpful, detailed article on what it might mean and what does investment actually look like as well as what to be careful of in thinking about um, frameworks for um, and strategies around investing. But for me, in terms of just to have uh, one minute to answer this question, um, kind of what do solutions look like? It means in terms of, and this is what a little bit what Saeed was talking about, it means to power shift, right? Like you're not gonna educate or train your way out of this. It means that we need to shift power, that the current power structures as they exist right now do not work. And so we need to change power, right? And I think that's really hard. And one of the things that I'm worried about is that there is a lot of appropriate focus on policing and on the criminal punishment system in this country. Um, and I think that hopefully, maybe I'm too hopeful that there will be that there will be change in that area. But it's not just that area that needs change, right? That it's healthcare, that it's education, that it's that it's in terms of labor and wages that people are being paid right now. Um, and so one of my worries, and I want to say, say this as a worry, but also as a possible solution, um, is that the areas that actually impact people's lives, right, such as education, um, are going to be a, a harder for people to actually think about how do we shift power in a substantive way. But in terms of the problems around systemic racism are not just a problem of policing. The problems around systemic racism are a problem about how power structure has been set up in this country and impacts so many institutions. So what solutions look like is looking at these different institutions in our society and understanding how they marginalize certain groups of people, especially Black people and Latinx people and Indigenous, right? And, and working to change those, right? And putting people who look like the people that they are actually impacting in power, right? To actually change those things. Um, so I'll, I'll just say that, oh, one last thing, because I'm not getting off this without saying this, which is around education, right? That there's been all these things about it, appropriate in terms of all the harm and the polite violence and higher education that has been done to so many of our colleagues, that has been done to so many of our students, right? And, and these new education initiatives that are coming out. Um, and I just like, and a lot of these are actually not about shifting power. They're just about trying to like duck and shift blame, right? And I think that we also, not just us, but some of our colleagues need to call these institutions into account. Okay, that's it for real. <laughs> All right, Elizabeth, yes. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, just on that, I am so frustrated. We got all these emails and I dip into a lot of different universities because I'm in this weird hybrid place right now, although now I'm officially Yale. But um, all these, you know, presidents are saying like, you know, systemic racism is bad, police, police brutality is bad. When they open up these campuses to students, the people who are, they are putting black workers at risk. So they wanna talk about ending systemic racism at these institutions. And they're basically saying, you know, I understand it's a difficult situation, but that the, the, the backbone of these universities, which are black and brown workers who are most vulnerable to getting COVID, that their lives don't matter, that the lives of their students mm -hmm. coming into these space, back to these spaces and back to campus is what matters. And it's just really, it's really upsetting to me. It just and endangering to these cities, which we know black people are gonna occupy the most uh, contact related occupations, right? Absolutely. So I wanna get um, just quickly in this last round Robin to get Kelly and to get Saida in in just like 31 minute seconds before we open up to Q and A. But are there any concrete solutions that you would su suggest? So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say what I say to my students, uh, which is that I want them to be student activists. And that doesn't mean like go out and get arrested. That means I want you to act on what you know. You are in this classroom, you are getting information. You take that information and you act on it. And then you do what, what James Baldwin so eloquently said is to act is to be committed. And to be committed is to put yourself in danger, right? And he's not talking about like getting assassinated. He's like, no, forfeit your whiteness. 
forfeit your power, forfeit all of the leverage that you have, that you have unearned to get where you are. I think that with all this education and we're all talking about book lists, podcasts, and you know, people have this insatiable appetite to, to learn, um, but they're not acting on it. You know, the, the extent of their actions is a Black Lives Matter and their sign, and then that's like, there, I did it. I read the book. It was great. I gave it five stars on, on you know, Amazon or whatever it is. And that's like it. And it's like, no, it requires constant daily moment to moment action. You cannot check a box. You cannot pat yourself on the back. You cannot have your black friend over for a barbecue. You cannot ask me what you think you should do. Right? Like you need to do the work yourself. You need to do the work yourself. And so, you know, for me, it's, it's about will. I think change is not about resources. We have that. It's not about, you know, know how or policy. We know, we know this. It is about will to do what is right, to act on what you know is right. So, so I'll, I'll say what I also, you know, in that spirit of what we tell our students, um, one thing that I teach my students every semester is a classic sociological study by Larry Bobo, uh, who studied implementation versus principles. He took a whole group of white people, very diverse, diverse in education, diverse in region, diverse in class. And he would ask them about principles. Do you, you know, believe in school desegregation? And it was very easy to get white people uh, how you maybe expect the chips to fall, right? The most racist, most, you know, uh, uh, regional sort of, you know, uh, uh, white people be like, nah, I don't, I don't even want my kids going to school with black kids. But you could get this sort of principle represented amongst white people saying, yes, I believe in desegregation. Much like you can ask them principles about Black Lives Matter. But when you ask them about implementation, what should actually be done? Does the So do you support busing? Should the government have a role in this? What policies would you support? Then there was this complete collapse. Then it was, oh, well, you know, we shouldn't be playing guinea pigs with kids and blah, blah. There was this complete collapse because I think the real hypocrisy, the scam that Douglas is calling out is between what white people will say they do and what they do because we know that that is a cavernous gap in our history, right? Um, and so I, you know, I, I, I tell my students every year, do not congratulate yourselves for what you know. You have no skin in the game yet. Wait until you are willing to keep your children in a zoned black public school. Wait until you are willing to not move off the block when there's four out of 15 households are, are, are black, right? And we know this from our data that white people actually, it's about two to three black households on their block before they're uncomfortable with, with the racial makeup of the block, right? We know that it's, it's this great moment that we can sort of, you know, uh, 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 say that our students are in, right? You know, it's, it's great to see white youth out in these protests, but that is also a bit of the, the symbolism because their actual decisions based on whiteness will continue to be self-incentivized by racial interests. So what, I, what I'd love to do right now is bring in a couple of questions. I've actually been weaving a lot of the questions into this kind of broader discussion, but there are a few that are pointed that I think are, are worth really highlighting and bringing up. And the first one is actually a compilation of several, several questions from the audience. Um, and so it starts off by saying, you know, the New York City Council voted to reduce the NYPD budget by 1 billion on July 1st in direct response to Black Lives Matter protests that have been going on in the city since, you know, since May. Um, so local organizers are using this moment to build local power. But what if anything can be done to make sure these efforts continue until after the December election or even beyond? Um, I also think we should also point out there's another part of the question that's uh, relevant. You know, what what federal legislative change can the movement bring? Especially since many of you are talking about power. Symbolism is nice, but what actual big legislative change can, this, can these movements bring? And then what actually, you know, related to this, what does success for these movements look like? Is it actually legislative change or is it something else? So anybody wanna jump in? You guys can just jump in here. Those are really big and excellent um, questions. 
I mean, I think, and, and Kelly's talked about this in, in, in some of her recent writing. I mean, one thing is that like, we cannot, we've got to keep the, the pressure on. We have to keep these protests on. And I think having these discussions and getting out in the streets and, and demanding justice is going to help bring about that change. Um, I guess if we're dreaming, I mean, I think that we need to talk about, we need to think about how we can facilitate um, a wealth redistribution. And I think the federal government's gonna have to um, help lead that. I would like to see things like a creation of something, I don't know, like the Department of Community Empowerment, um, where we're thinking about how we can reallocate funds as we keep on talking about um, to go to, to communities, to go to, lo to local organizations who really need them. Um, and I think that's going to require some major restructuring. And again, like, you know, it's not as if during this administration, we're going to get that department. But I think if we continue these conversations, if we continue to reckon with our history, if we continue to, um, to, to understand um, and to recognize the ways in which uh, what systemic racism, racism is, how our institutions have been shaped and fueled uh, by racial inequality historically, we will get closer to realizing that kind of major change that we need. But we need, um, we need a wealth redistribution. I, I would say one of our metrics going forward, I mean, I, I too am actually, you know, I know that, you know, that our systems of justice are imperfect, but I sort of lean on the Charles Hamilton Houston type of, you know, the idea that no, there is an architecture in our laws and in our policies to actually do exactly what Liz is saying about redistributing um, um, uh, much of this uh, power and wealth. Um, I would say our metrics going forward should certainly be um, you know, this, this news cycle will soon be over. There will inevitably and tragically be another shooting. There will be something else, right? Kim Kardashian will have an eighth baby. Something else will happen. And this moment will be over. And what do we have from it, right? Some statues have come down. Here's what I think it's very important to understand the scope of the game of the neo-confederacy. They didn't just put up statues, right? That was symbolic. The daughters of the confederacy, that was the tip of their iceberg putting up statues. Their real campaign was changing school policy to make sure that textbooks were revamped to glorify white supremacy. That was their real game plan. And we have sort of only gotten to the tip of that iceberg and been like, well, if you bring the statues down, that's it. But what are we putting up in place of them, right? What is EJI calling for us to do? Where are our, our memorials about lynching? Where do we have anything that has forced the white public to be uncomfortable about this, right? The news cycle will be over. And what do we have left? It can't be the changing of the names of buildings. If it hasn't cost white people anything, then it hasn't moved the yardage on the field. Come on now, come on now. <laughs> oh, I love this. I'm gonna get into it. I think this is actually a really good lead in to this next question, which was it's at, on, a, on its face seems like a really simple question, but it's how do we in the academy or we as researchers practice anti-racism in our work? And I'll offer a caveat by saying, that many of us already practice anti-racism in our work because Black Studies was founded as an anti-racist, anti-black, you know, like anti anti-blackness project. Um, but I am interested to hear from the panelists about what not maybe not just academia because this is this is bigger than academia. Although you know, very specifically, this is what we can do. But what can institutions, whether they be public or private, right? Particularly since a lot of people are listening on this call right now, um, on this on this uh, chat right now. What can we actually do in the project of anti-racism? What does that look like? Um, Kelly, why don't we start off with you? Yeah. So I am a historian, but I am housed in the Department of Africana Studies. And the only reason I have this job is because student activists pretty much took over the campus and demanded that there be a department, demanded that there be Black faculty. So I am a result of their activism. So I think now is the time to quit with these Africana study programs and make them departments and stop having these sort of like quasi, you know, weird institutional um, 
names, make them full departments, give them tenure track lines, create a uh, create a pipeline of faculty, black faculty that are not just recruited, but also retained and then also paid very well for the work that they do. Uh, I think that's really important having a set of endowments put in place to make sure that black faculty and black studies and, and everything that is required to keep a functional, uh, healthy, sustainable department exists and is put in place. Um, I can't tell you how many times you know, we look at academia and the first places that get cut are Black studies, women's studies, Latinx studies. We're always on the chopping block before, just before or right after coronavirus started, was it Ohio University that cut their Black studies and their women's studies? Um, it was Columbia University that was the latest Ivy League to finally get a department. Um, so it, it just doesn't make sense to me that in 2020, we don't have full-fledged departments that are funded, that are, are, are respected in the same way that we would respect political science or history or anything of that nature. So, you know, for me, definitely making sure that these uh, departments are protected, created and then protected and then funded uh, is super important to me. There's a there's a real thread that I, that both of you are talking about that uh, needs to be said on the historical record. Black studies departments exist um, because of the movement of the 1960s, right? We're all founded between like 68 and 72, right? Um, what happened was, you know, again, I think when we talk about direct action black movements, when we talk about black liberation, part of the very racist myth that's told about them is, a, oh, well, that was ineffective, right? Because, you know, marching peacefully in the streets in the civil rights movement, that's what allowed you guys to um, go to the same malls as us. But it must have been black power that was ineffective. Actually, it's literally black power that gets absorbed into universities and becomes black studies departments. We are here today because they burned things down, because they had social service programs, because they organized directly around Black liberation. That is the reason you have Black Studies Departments. When I think of that being 50 years ago, we really are on the 50 year mark. The 50 years ago, our movement was to just break into the pores of these institutions. And now I think our next 50 years is really about de colonizing these institutions that as Kelly's point, we're on the margins, right? Literally African-American studies at, at Boston University, one of the, uh, the second oldest, I believe in the country is literally across the mass turnpike from the rest of BU's campus, right? We're, that was quite deliberately done by this white backlash within our institution to dilute and make ineffectual the black our African-American studies department. Now it's about making sure that we decolonize the rest of these curriculums, right? It, it's one thing to have, you know, race and ethnicity courses, black political thought courses, but why is your political theory course so white supremacist, right? That's what we are doing now. So I want to make sure we have, we have about two minutes left. I want to make sure we get Megan and Elizabeth in on these closing comments. And I think the anti-racist comment is, uh, question is actually a good one to, to really wrap up here. So Megan, you want to jump in? Yeah, I'll just jump in in terms of thinking about a kind of this question, of course, about where do we go from here and solutions. And I think a lot of really, I think a lot has been said. Um, but in terms of, I mean, one of the things I, I really also want to underscore from people is that like, when, as we, as we fight and struggle for change in this moment, that it's, it's slow and, and, and then it can move really quickly, right? And that I think sometimes we want it all right now and we should want it all right now, but just because we don't have exactly what we want right now, doesn't mean that the work that we are doing right now isn't gonna lead to something in the future. Um, and so I'm, I'm of course thinking about in terms of, there's so, it, there's so far that we have to go right now um, but there is so much work that has been done. This kind of the national discourse about defunding the police um, and all the activism in terms of around getting police out of schools and, and the quick changes that have happened over the course of this month, that's transformational. I, I put it on social media before. I, policing got normalized to me in high school. I, I, I never, like, before school, during school, after school, that at dances, police were everywhere. 
right? Um, and I'm so excited for perhaps a new generation of students who don't have to like have police as, 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 a, as a constant force in their lives. So there has been a tremendous amount of progress that has been made and like really want to appreciate the work of organizers, especially in thinking about um, the work around voting rights, the work around abolition and defunding. Um, but that like, there's still so much work that actually needs to be done. And one of the things I think that Saida mentioned that I'm always thinking about, it's not that just that we have to fight like the structures that exist in this moment, but we like the other side, um, it, it, there are they're already also counter planning, right? So there's always a backlash to progress <laughs> that has happened in our society. So it's not just that what we see right now, we have to combat, but like there are other strategizing that is of course happening behind the scenes right now um, that we need to actually get ready for. Um, so on there. Elizabeth. Well, I don't know how much I have to add. I mean, I think that the the, um, the comments have been not surprisingly, since all of you are so brilliant and wonderful, but um, really on point on this. But I guess I'll just say um, that I think you know what we're talking about. Me, everything that we've been talking about today means that white people, especially people in the people in power, um, and also middle and upper middle class people, are going to have to give something up if we wanna realize this kind of society we're talking about, um, but it especially means that white people are gonna to have to give something up. And so being anti-racist means that if you're committed to this, that you're also committed to giving, giving something up. So um, I'm gonna wrap it up here, but I do wanna end on a note that one brings a lot of these themes together, but is relatively optimistic and to say that in a very short period of time, built on the work that these people have been doing, that people have been doing for centuries, really for a very long time, we seem like we are on the fragile cusp of something transformative, something significant, something big. There is potential there, right? There are all kinds of things at the margins or even at the center that may pull us back, but the potential and the opportunity for transformation and for transformative change is there and it's built on the back of protest and on the back of this kind of movement for black lives. But I'd also like to point out and just end with this by saying one of the things that has been consistent about what the panelists have been saying is that the blueprint, the roadmap is there. And part of how we get to that roadmap and part of how we get to whether it be reconciliation, whether it be systemic change, whether it be structural change, what have you, part of how we do that is by listening to the people who have been doing this work all along, right? This is not new, this is not a new story. So listen to your employees, listen to the people on the ground, listen to what the protesters are actually saying, and maybe in our lifetime, we'll actually see transformative change. So from all of us and from the Ash Center at the Harvard Kennedy School, thank you so much. This has been really wonderful and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much.